Hey folks, today we're going to read The Partner's Tale, part of the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. Uh, if you recall, uh, at the beginning, the travelers were on their way to Canterbury, and uh, they decided to make the storytelling contest where um, whoever told the best story, the, the story that had the best moral lesson and was the, the most entertaining, would win a free feast when they returned to the Tabard Inn um, after their journey to Canterbury. And this is one of the entries. Um, it's told by the partner. The partner was the last person in the prologue. Uh, we we learned about him um, that he was he had a he had a small goat's voice. Uh, he sold fake relics and pardons to people and kept the money himself. So he was a swindler and a crook and um, just generally a bad person. Uh, and he's the one who's going to be telling this story. What's ironic about it is the story that we're going to read here is a morality play. It's a story, a Christian story that teaches an obvious Christian moral and in which characters are named for vices and virtues. Your three main characters in this are called the three rioters. Now we tend to think of rioters as people who are, you know, going and, and plundering towns and things uh, due to, you know, some reason for a riot, but that's not, not what they were back in the day. What we're talking about is riotous living, people who drink and swear and visit whorehouses and live badly. So essentially these three guys are the three sinners, if you want to think about it that way. Um, and the moral lesson he's going to tell you right off the bat is radix malorum est cupiditas, which is the love of money is the root of all evil. It's where that modern saying money is the root of all evil comes from. Um, but it's very clear that it's the love of money is the root of all evil. And this is some supreme irony on Chaucer's part because uh, the partner as a character loves money and he's preaching a sermon about how the love of money is evil. Think about that for a second. Why does he preach the sermon? Because if he can convince you that money is evil, then you want to give him your money because you want to get rid of your evil. And so it's a win-win for him. But it creates this sort of paradox between the deliverer and their morality and the message and its morality and how they're sort of in conflict with each other, which makes the partner, I think, an uh, unreliable narrator in the sense that you can't trust that he believes what he's telling you. He's telling it to you for a particular reason. Um, is it still a good story? This is something we're going to talk about at the end. Can you tell a good story and have it be a moral story and a moving story and you yourself be a terrible human being, which is going to bring us uh, into the modern world and look at, at some people who, you know, there are, there are these big televangelists, church pastors who uh, make tons of money off of their their online churches. A number of them end up getting busted. You know, they're driving their Maserati or their yacht around and they get busted with um, drugs or prostitutes or whatever it happens to be. Does that invalidate their life's work? Bill Cosby, uh, very funny guy, like uh, had a great show that I loved as a kid that taught all kinds of important moral lessons and seemed wholesome and good. But then look what, what he did and like how that turned out. Does that invalidate his show? These are some questions that we need to ask ourselves. And so Chaucer seems to be asking this question, but I think the question is bigger than, you know, if, is, is, if the partner's a bad person, does it invalidate his lesson? It's more along the lines of if a lot of people involved in the church are bad people, does it invalidate the lessons of the church, which is a bigger and more complicated question. Uh, and it's it's an important one. And so we want to think about that as we read this piece. Uh, it's a fun piece, though. I think you're going to enjoy it. So The Partner's Prologue by Jeffrey Chaucer. Oh, it starts with The Partner's Prologue. Right. So you recall we had the overall general prologue, which introduced all the characters. Well, after everybody finishes telling their story, we go back to the frame. It's a frame narrative. We go back to the frame and we have the characters talking to each other before another character starts up their story. And so uh, this is after uh, one character has told the story and then the partner is going to start up with the partner's story. So essentially we're, we're back in the prologue. The prologue is in between all of the stories, kind of like that big picture frame that has a bunch of little pictures in it. Uh, they're all part of the big frame. And in between every two pictures is the mat, the background. And that's what this is. Uh, but it tells you something more about the partner's character as if you, you needed to know. So I've got to put on my goat's voice uh, to do this partner bit, but 
you know, apologies in advance for how great that's going to sound. My lords, he said, in churches where I preach, I cultivate a haughty kind of speech and ring it out as roundly as a bell. I've got it all by heart, this tale I tell. I have a text. It's always the same. And always has been since I learned the game. Interesting that he refers to this as a game. Old as the hills and fresher than grass, radix malorum est cupiditas. Remember, that's uh, not technically money is the root of all evil, but the love of money is the root of all evil. Um, I preach as you have heard me say before and tell a hundred lying mockeries more. I take great pains stretching out my neck. To east and west I crane and peck. Just like a pigeon sitting on a barn, my hands and tongues together spin the yarn, and all my antics are a joy to see. The curse of avarice and cupidity is all my sermon, for it frees the pelf. Out come the pence, and specially for myself, for my exclusive purpose is to win, and not at all to castigate their sin. Once dead, what matter how their souls may fare? They can go blackberrying for all I care. So he very clearly says, I preach about money being the root of all evil, so people will get rid of their money and make me rich. I don't care whether people go to heaven or hell. They go to hell for all I care. It doesn't bother me. Uh, I just want to win. I don't want to change them away from sin. And thus I preach against the very vice I make my living out of, avarice. And yet, however guilty of that sin myself with others i have the power to win them from it i can bring them to repent but that is not my principal intent so he's like i i change lives with my sermons i don't mean to i do um i want to get rich that's a good picture of the partner there and covetousness is both the root and stuff of all i preach that ought to be enough well then i give examples thick and fast from bygone times old stories from the past a yokel mind loves the stories from of old, being the kind it can repeat and hold. What? Do you think as long as I can preach and get their silver for the things I teach, that I will live in poverty by choice? That's not the counsel of my inner voice. No, let me preach and beg from church to church and never do an honest job of work. No nor make baskets like St. Paul to gain a livelihood. I do not preach in vain. There's no apostle I would counterfeit. I mean to have money, wool and cheese and wheat, though it were given to me by the poorest lad or the poorest village widow, though she had a string of starving children all agape. No, let me drink the liquor of the grape and keep a jolly wench in every town. Pause. Oh, this guy's like, yeah, I'm not lying. I'm going to teach real sermons, but I do it so I can get rich. And I'll take the last dollar from a poor orphan child. I will take the last dollar from a village widow whose husband's dead and all of her kids are starving. I'll take that money and I'll turn it into wine, just like Jesus did, and drink that wine down. Um, this guy's a pretty despicable guy, right? Like, we're getting a really clear picture of who he is, and Chaucer isn't pulling any punches. He's a guy who's involved with the church and is using the church for his own personal benefit. But listen, gentlemen, to bring things down to a conclusion, would you like a tale? Now, as I've drunk a draft of corn ripe ale, by God it stands to reason, I can strike on some good story that you will all like. For though I am a wholly vicious man, don't think I can't tell moral tales. I can. Here's one I often preach when out for winning. All right, so that was the end of the partner's prologue. Uh, we've learned a little bit about him and how despicable he is, but his tale itself is going to be a morality play. And what's interesting is, we'll read the tale, but think about if we took this tale out of the prologue and away from the partner himself and just told it to you as a story, it would have an entirely different feeling than it does knowing who's telling it to us and why they're telling it to us. I think that's fascinating. We'll talk about that at the end. The Pardoner's Tale. It's of three rioters, I have to tell, who, long before the morning service bell, were sitting in a tavern for a drink. And as they sat, they heard the handbell clink before a coffin going to the grave. Uh, so we've got three rioters, three sinners, three people who live sinfully. Uh, they're hanging out in a tavern for a drink. It's almost last call. And the handbell clinks for a coffin going to the grave. There's been a plague. We're going to see this. Um, it's, it's a time of plague. People are dying left and right. Um, anyway, 
Um, one of them said to the little tavern knave, uh, go and find out at once. Look spry whose corpse is that in the coffin passing by. And so you get the name correctly, too. Sir, said the boy, no need, I promise you. Two hours before you came here, I was told he was a friend of yours in days of old. And suddenly last night, the man was slain. Upon his bench, face up, dead drunk again. There came a privy thief, they call him Death, who kills us all around here, and in a breath, he speared him through the heart, and he never stirred, and then Death went his way without a word. Now, the death we're talking about here is the plague itself. But the plague is personified as the Grim Reaper. You know, that guy with the, the sickle and the skull face and the robes? That guy. He speared him through. He killed their friend. The guy in the coffin who's going by the door was a friend of these three rioters. Um, now, they're so drunk that they're going to come up with a crazy plan. And I love it. Um, He's killed a thousand in this present plague, and, sir, it doesn't do to be too vague. If you should meet him, you had best be wary. Be on your guard with such an adversary. Be primed to meet him everywhere you go. That's what my mother said. That's all I know. So um, this kid gives good advice to the three rioters that they're going to ignore. Be ready to meet death anywhere you go. Uh, he's killed a thousand people in this plague. You've got to be super careful. It's not safe. The publican, that's the bartender, joined in with, Bye, St. Mary, what the child says is right. You'd best be wary. This very year he killed in a large village a mile away, man, woman, and serf at tillage. Page in the household, children, all there were. Yes, I imagine that he lives around there. It's well to be prepared in these alarms. He might do you dishonor. So the bartender's like, yeah, the whole village up the street, literally everybody died. There's nobody alive in that village. They all got the plague, and 100% of them are dead. But that means that death probably lives up there. His home is probably up there near that village. Ha! Huh, God's arms! The rioter said. Is he so fierce to meet? I'll search for him by Jesus, street by street. God's blessed bones, I'll register a vow. Um, I'm going to pause here. Uh, this rioter is um, clearly going to look for death, which is what the kid told him not to do. Uh, but he's got a reason for it, and we're going to see that. But one thing that you should note is this guy swears all the time. Now, nowadays we have swear words that are like the F word and the S word and stuff like that. Uh, back then, the blasphemies were using God's name in vain. Huh, God's arms. That was vulgar back then. That's like dropping the F bomb. F, right? Um, I'll say, is he so fierce to meet? God's blessed bones. That's another F bomb right there. So this guy's swearing left and right. Uh, he's foul. He's vulgar. Here, chaps, the three of us together now. Hold up your hands like me, and we'll be brothers in this affair, and each defend the others. And we will kill this traitor death, I say. Away with him as he has made away with all our friends. God's dignity tonight. So there's another swear. But these three rioters decide that they're all going to get in this thing and be brothers together, and their plan is to kill death. They're going to go find the Grim Reaper. They're going to knock him down. They're going to jump on him and break all of his bones, and then death will be dead. Aha. Right? Like, they're so drunk that they actually think that the that death is a real person and that they can go find him and kill him. They made their bargain, swore with appetite, these three to live, oh sorry, I should be in my partner voice. They made a bargain, swore with appetite, these three to live and die for one another, as brother born might swear to his born brother. And up they started, in their drunken rage, and made toward this village, which the page and publican had spoken of before. Many and grisly were the oaths they swore, tearing Christ's blessed body to a shred. If we can only catch him, death is dead. It's such a great line, death is dead. When they had gone not fully half a mile, just as they were about to cross a stile, pause, you gotta know what a stile is. Uh, back in the day, uh, they didn't want sheep to be getting out of the sheep folds or, you know, animals to get out of their pens. Uh, but there really weren't gates you could put in stone walls. And so they would create these things. We Nowadays we call them baffles, but it would be a stile um I can't really draw it, but it'd be like a, a little area where animals couldn't see that there was a gap in the fence, but there was a gap in the fence and people could pass through. But really only one person could pass through at a time. And so uh, they're getting to the stile. They came, just as they were about to cross a stile, they came upon a very poor old man who humbly greeted them and thus began. So they're trying to go through this stile at the same time that an old man is trying to go through from the other side. If you are good people, you let the old person through. Uh, because it's the right thing to do. But these drunk rioters are not good people. Uh, the old man talks. Good God look to you, my lords, and give you quiet. To which the proudest of these men of riot gave back the answer, What old fool? Give place. Why are you all wrapped up except your face? Why live so long? Isn't it time to die? 
how incredibly rude this is. First off, the old man's wrapped up like a mummy, and the only thing they can see is his face. That's interesting. Um, but he calls him an old fool, which is rude to the age. You're supposed to respect your elders. Tells him to get out of his way instead of letting him through. And then he says, why have you lived so long, old man? Isn't it time to die? Shouldn't you be dead, old man? How are you still alive? That's just rude. The old, old fellow looked him in the eye and said, Because I never yet have found a way of walk to India, searching round, village and city on my pilgrimage, what it would change his youth to have my age, and my soul my age is mine and must be still upon me, for such a time as God may will. Not even death, alas, will take my life, so like a wretched prisoner at strife within himself, I walk alone and wait about the earth which is my mother's gate, knock, knocking with my staff from night to noon and crying, Mother! Open up to me soon. You know how old people always take forever with their answers? This old guy answers the question. His answer is like ridiculously long. You can tell that these rioters have stopped paying attention entirely. Uh, but he's basically complaining. He's like, don't you think I want to die? You think it's fun being old? Being old sucks. I wish I would die. Right? Like that's sort of his answer in this really long-winded way. He's knocking on the earth with his staff, calling the earth his mother and asking her to open up to form a grave so we can fall in and die. Um, mother, open up to me soon. Look at me, mother. Won't you let me in? See how I wither, flesh and blood and skin. Alas, when will these bones be laid to rest? Mother, I would exchange for that were best the wardrobe in my chamber standing there so long for yours. Aye, for a shirt of hair to wrap me in. She has refused her grace. Whence comes the withered pallor of my face? But, it dishonored you when you began to speak so roughly, son, to an old man, unless he had an injured you in word or deed. It says in holy right, as you may read, thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor it, and therefore be it said, do no more harm to an old man than you, being now young, would have another do when you are old, if you should live till then. And so, may God be with you, gentlemen, for I must go whither I have to go. And so at the end of this, he's like, what about the golden rule? Treat people the way you want it to be treated. How do you want to be treated when you're old? Treat me that way. That's how you're supposed to treat your elders. Um, so he schools them. He gives them a lesson, which, again, old people are, are really happy to do that kind of thing. And then he bids them good day and wants to leave. But remember, they want to pass through first. Hey, there's your old man. By God, the gambler said, you shan't do so. You don't get off so easy by St. John. I heard you mention, just a moment gone, a certain traitor, Death, who singles out and kills the fine young fellows hereabout. And you're his spy. By God, you wait a bit. Say where he is or you'll pay for it. By God and by the holy sacrament, I say you've joined together by consent to kill us younger folk, you thieving swine. So he calls him a thieving pig. He, he heard the old man mention Death, and he's like, oh. <gasps> You know death. Tell me where he is. I'm going to kill him. Right. So like the he's, he's trying to find out from this old man where death is. Well, sirs, he said, if it be your sorry, if it be your design to find out death, turn up this crooked way toward that grove. I left him there today under a tree and there you'll find him waiting. So he points away into the distance, and he's like, You see that tree over there under that oak tree? There's death. I saw him earlier. You go find him. Um. He isn't one to hide for all your prating. You see that oak? He won't be far to find. And God protect you that redeem mankind. I and amend you. Thus the ancient man, he leaves. At once the three young rioters began to run and reach the tree. And there they found a pile of golden florins on the ground. New coined eight bushels of them as they thought. No longer was it death those fellows sought, for they were also thrilled to see the sight. The florins were so beautiful and bright that down they sat beside the precious pile. Pause. So the old man tells them that death is waiting for them under this tree. And they go looking for death, but instead of death, they find gold. Piles and piles of gold. And they're like, holy crap, look at all this gold. And they forget that they're out there looking for death or trying to kill death. Uh, and all they can think about is the money that they found. The wickedest spoke first after a while. Brothers, he said, you listen to what I say. I'm pretty sharp, although I joke away. It's clear fortune has bestowed this treasure to let us live in jollity and pleasure. Light come, light go, we'll spend it as we ought. God's precious dignity! Who would have thought this morning was to be our lucky day? Now he's still talking because the quotation doesn't end. But I love his first reaction. He sees all this money and he's like, guys, guys, 
Are you thinking what I'm thinking? We never have to be sober again. Like, that's his thought. We get to live the rest of our lives in jollity and pleasure. We can drink all day. We can visit, you know, whorehouses. We can do all the great things that we want to do. Um, how lucky. Now he continues. If one could only get the gold away, back to my house, or else to yours, perhaps. For as you know, the gold is ours, chaps. We'll all be on top of fortune, hey? But certainly it can't be done by day. People would call us robbers, a strong gang, so our own property would make us hang. No, we must bring this treasure back by night, some prudent way, and keep it out of sight. And so, as a solution, I propose, we draw for lots and see the way it goes. The one who draws the longest, lucky man, shall run into town as quickly as he can to fetch us bread and wine, but keep things dark, while two remain in hiding here to mark our heap of treasure. If there's no delay, when night comes down, we'll carry it away, all three of us, wherever we have planned. And so the guy says, okay, it's almost dawn. We can't be carrying this treasure into town in the wheelbarrow, or people will say we robbed somebody and they will hang us and take the money from us. We've got to get the money to one of our houses. We've got to get it in, in the darkness of night so nobody knows we have it, and that way we'll be able to keep the money. But we also don't want to get sober. So here's what we're going to do. Two of us will stay and guard the treasure. One of us will go into town, and he'll bring back beer or wine and, and food. And we'll eat and drink all day long, and as soon as night comes, we'll go and take the treasure and hide it somewhere. Seems like a good plan, right? Um, he gathered lots and hid them in his hand, bidding them draw for where the luck should fall. It fell upon the youngest of them all, and off he ran at once toward the town. As soon as he had gone, the first one sat down and thus began a parley with the other. You know that you can trust me as a brother. Now, let me tell you where your profit lies. You know our friend has gone to get supplies. And here's a lot of gold that is to be divided equally amongst us three. Nevertheless, if I could shape things thus so that we shared it out, the two of us, wouldn't you take it as a friendly act? But how? The other said. He knows the fact that all the gold was left with me and you. What can we tell him? What are we to do? Is it a bargain? Said the first. Or no? For I can tell you in a word or so what's to be done to bring the thing about. Oh, uh, trust me, the other said. You needn't doubt my word. I won't betray you. I'll be true. Pause. Now, of course, as soon as one of them leaves, the other one starts thinking about fractions. And he's like, we could split all this gold three ways. Or we could split it two ways. Right? And he's definitely plotting something. And the other one's going along with it. Well said his friend. You see that we are two, and two are twice as powerful as one. Now look, when he comes back, get up in fun to have a wrestle, and then as you attack, I'll up and put my dagger in his back. <laughs> While you and he are struggling as in a game, then draw your dagger too, and do the same. Then all this money will be ours to spend, divided equally, of course, dear friend. Then we can gratify our lusts and fill the day with dicing at our own sweet will. Thus these two miscreants agreed to slay the third and youngest, as you heard me say. So, the guy's going to come back with, with alcohol and food, and rioter number two, for lack of a better word, is going to be like, well, I want to have a wrestle, and the two of them will start wrestling, and then rioter number one's going to pull out his knife and stab him in the back. That's going to be like, ah! And as he's stabbed in the back, rioter number two's going to pull out his knife and stab him in the front. He's going to be like, ah! 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 You know, like, from both sides, until he's, he's dead. And then they'll be able to share the money two ways. Genius plan. The youngest, as he ran toward the town, kept turning over, rolling up and down within his heart, the beauty of those bright new florins, saying, Lord, to think I might have all that treasure to myself alone. Could there be anyone beneath the throne of God so happy as then I should be? All right, and so this, this youngest rider who's going to town starts thinking about fractions. He's like, we could split the gold three ways, or we could split the gold one way. Right? And so the fiend, that capital F means we're talking about Satan, our common enemy was given power to put in his thought that there was always poison to be bought, and that with poison he could kill his friends. To man in such a state the devil sends thoughts of this kind, and has full permission to lure them on to sorrow and perdition, for this young man was utterly content to kill them both and never to repent. And on he ran. He had no thought to tarry. Came to the town, found an apothecary. Pause. Apothecary is what the British call chemist and what we in America call a pharmacist. 
and said, Sell me some poison, if you will. I have a lot of rats I want to kill. And there's a polecat, too, about my yard that takes my chickens and it hurt, hits me hard. But I'll get even, as is only right, with vermin that destroy a man by night. Pause. That is a lie that he tells, but what's funny about this lie is how true it is. Uh, he's got a couple of rats he wants to kill. Those guys are acting like rats, right? Like, there's something to be said there. It also goes back to the partner's original description, how his hair fell down like rat's tails. I think that's interesting. Um, and a polecat's a weasel. A weasel is well known to be a thief and a sneak uh, and, and sort of like evil. And so this, the descriptions of the animals that he wants to kill with these poison, this poison fits directly the descriptions of the guys who are plotting to murder him. Uh, it's only right to um, kill vermin that destroy a man by night. That's what they're planning to do. Aha! Uh -huh. Right, like it all fits so well. Anyway, the chemist answered, I have a preparation which you shall have, and by my soul's salvation, if any living creature eat or drink a mouthful, ere he has the time to think. And though he took less than makes a grain of wheat, you'll find him fall down dying at your feet. Yes, die he must, and in so short a while, you'd hardly have the time to walk a mile. The poison is so strong, you understand. This cursed fellow grabbed into his hand the box of poison, and away he ran into a neighboring street, and found a man who lent him three large bottles. He withdrew and deftly poured the poison into two. He kept the third one clean as well he might for his own drink, meaning to work all night, stacking the gold and carrying it away. And when this rioter, this devil's clay, had filled his bottles up with wine, all three, back to rejoin his comrades, sauntered he. Why make a sermon of it? Why waste breath? Exactly in the way they planned his death, they fell on him and slew him, two to one. Then said the first of them, when this was done, Now for a drink. Sit down and let's be merry, for later on there'll be a corpse to bury. And as it happened, reaching for a sup, he took a bottle full of poison up and drank. And his companion, nothing loath, drank from it also, and they perished both. There is, in Avicenna's long relation concerning poison and its operation, trust me, no ghastlier section to transcend what these two wretches suffered at their end. Thus these two murderers received their due, so did the treacherous young poisoner too. Pause. So what happens at the end of the story? All three of them die. And so what's the moral here? Well, the partner said it was radix malorum escupiditas, which means the love of money is the root of all evil. And they all kill each other over the love of money. But there's lots of other great morals in this story, too. It's a very moral tale and very well told. Um, let's see. They treated an old man badly, so they got a little bit of poetic justice or karma from that. right? They all deserve to die. Was this poetic justice for them? I think it was. Um, so they treated the old man badly. Uh, also, they were going looking for, what were they looking for? Oh, right, death. What did they find? Death. Don't go looking for death. By the way, did they actually meet death? I think it was the old man. I'm just putting that out there. Look at the way the old man's described. He's got a staff. He's all bony. The only thing you can see is his head. Everything else is wrapped up. I'm just saying. Uh, so I think that works, too, um, in this story from that perspective. And then they all swore to be brothers and, and to work together in this endeavor. And then they broke that because it turns out that to them, gold was more important than friendship. Is it? You know, when it becomes more important than friendship, then you run into problems. So there's a lot of really good lessons here. But foundationally, the partner is trying to teach the lesson, Radix Malorum Escupiditas, the love of money is the root of all evil. And I think that comes across very strongly. Uh, but let's see what he does with it. Let's see. Uh, Thus the two murderers received their due, and so did the treacherous young poisoner too. Oh, cursed sin! Oh, blackguardly excess! Oh, treacherous homicide! Oh, wickedness! Oh, gluttony that lusted on and diced! Dearly beloved, God forgive your sin and keep you from the vice of avarice. My holy, holy pardon frees you from all of this, provided that you make the right approaches, that is, with sterling rings or silver brooches. Bow down your heads under this holy bull. Come on, you women, offer up your wool. I'll write your name into my ledger so. Into the bliss of heaven you shall go, for I absolve you by my holy power, you that make offering clean as at the hour when you were born. 
that says is how I preach. And Jesus Christ sells ye or I, the leech of every soul, grant pardon and relieve you of sin, for that is best. I won't deceive you. Oh, one thing I should have mentioned in my tale, dear people, I have some relics in my bale, and pardons do, as full and fine, I hope, as any in England, given to me by the Pope. If there be one among you that is willing to have my absolution for a shilling devoutly given, come and do not harden your hearts, but kneel in humbleness for pardon, or else receive my pardon as we go. You can renew it every town or so, always provided that you still renew each time in good money what is due. It is an honor to you to have found a pardoner with his credentials sound who can absolve you as you ply the spur in any accident that may occur. For instance, we are all at fortune's beck. Your horse may throw you down and break your neck. With our security it is to all to have me here among you and at call with a pardon for the lowly and the great when souls leave the body for future state. And I advise our host here to begin the most enveloped of you all in sin. Come forward, host, you shall be the first to pay, and kiss my holy relics right away. Only a groat! Come on, unbuckle your purse. And that's how his story ends. So complicated. I mean, the guy is clearly a deceiver, a charlatan, a trickster, a con artist. He's trying to get money from people. He tells them a story about how money is the root of all evil, so they'll get rid of their money and he'll get rich. And he's so unashamed about it, too. Um, even asking the people on the trip to, to buy his stuff after he's told them they're all fake. What do you do with that? And let's, let's ask that question. Put that question um, down below uh, for today's classwork. Uh, can an evil person still do good work? I think that's what Chaucer's asking. His partner's terrible. He's a horrible human being. Does his evilness, does his own greed, does the fact that he falls into the sin that he's preaching against, does that invalidate his story? Or can he still be doing God's work even though he's doing it for the wrong reasons? You know, this is this is the question. And there's a lot of things that we can talk about here. Uh, I want you to sort of come up with your own answer and think about it. But some things to think about um, that I, I, I totally think Chaucer's doing here. Um, if the pardoner represents the church, then maybe his story represents the Bible. Right? Uh, can the story still be a good story, a meaningful story? if the person who's peddling it is corrupt, if the person who's peddling it is greedy? What if the partner himself represents the Catholic Church in medieval times? I mean, you look at those churches, they're opulent, those cathedrals. Think about the money that went into building them. And, and think about, I mean, look at, look at the pictures that see even now of the Pope in Rome and the gold everywhere and the kind of staffs and clothes and silks and gems and all the things that they wear. Is this church not greedy? Should it be giving that money to the poor instead of building these giant edifices for itself? And if that's the case, could the partner be symbolic of the church in general? And it's greed and it's, it's desire for, for wealth and power as opposed to what it should be doing. Um, you know, there's, there's something here, but is it still doing good work, even if its motives are not good? Chaucer is getting at some really deep stuff here, some really powerful and important stuff. And he's doing it through this, this tale and this partner who, on the surface, are very easy to dismiss. But when you start thinking about the complexities of what's going on here, it just gets, it gets more and more difficult um, to come to a conclusion. All right, I'm going to stop there. Uh, certainly, hopefully, giving you some things to think about. I uh, can't wait to hear your reactions.